So a little while ago, I did a video on movies that I thought were better than the book. And almost immediately after doing that video, I thought of one in particular that I was, it was kind of like half the inspiration for that video and I somehow forgot it. And then I was like, well, if I want to like talk about that, I have to think of some more so I can do a part two. But also, I was like, I can't post directly after this another series of movies that I think are better than the book because people are gonna think that I don't like books. <laughs> so I had to put some book videos. Well, that didn't really work out either because like probably the majority of the videos that I've posted since then have been like House of the Dragon, <laughs> which <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway, I have some more um, and we're just gonna start. So I don't forget it this time. We're gonna start with the one that I forgot last time. And then I'm sure as soon as I finish this video, I'll probably think of some more and this will just never end because it turns out I hate books and I love movies. So the book in question that I forgot last time was The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. I love The Secret History by Donna Tartt, which has never been adapted, which kind of surprises me. I mean, I feel like it's inevitable someday someone will adapt it. So, and it's a little surprising that the first adaptation of Donna Tartt's work was the Goldfinch and not The Secret History, but you know, I don't know the ins and outs of why that happened. In any case, after loving The Secret History, of course, I was like super eager to read The Goldfinch. And I also knew there was a movie of it. So I read The Goldfinch and it was a big, big disappointment. <laughs> there are things about it that are good. It's, it's, it's quality for the most part. It's better than, you know, a lot of books that I've read. It's by no means garbage. It's not a terrible book, but Compared to my expectations, compared to what I know Donna Tartt is capable of, see the secret history, it just, it just wasn't it. And I couldn't totally actually pinpoint why it wasn't working for me because her writing is beautiful and evocative and filled with imagery and she's good at, you know, character driven stories, etc. But the Goldfinch, it started out strong. I, the beginning of it, I was like, here we go. We're back. Donna's at it again. The beginning, I was like devouring. But then if you've read The Goldfinch or seen the movie, the beginning takes place in New York City when our the protagonist is uh, a young boy. And then a huge chunk of the middle of the book does not take place in New York anymore. He goes somewhere else. Um, it's not like mega spoilery. It's not like a thriller or anything, but I still don't want to say in case you want to go in totally blind. But so he goes elsewhere for a big portion of the book. And if you don't know anything about The Goldfinch, The Goldfinch, it is about, but not really, it's named at least for a painting of a goldfinch that is to my knowledge a real painting and that is the depiction on the cover. The cover is that that painting. In the beginning of the book, um, so I don't think this is super spoilery because it's kind of like the inciting incident that sets this whole thing up, is that our protagonist is at a museum when there is a um, an explosion. I believe it was a bombing. It's been a few, I mean I read it a few years ago. I think it was a bombing and he's there when that happens and he was looking at this goldfinch painting and he takes the goldfinch painting like rescues it from this bombing and so he has this painting for like the rest of the book but you know it's like this it's a famous painting and so he just kind of keeps it hidden a lot of things in his life kind of not happen necessarily directly because of that but they kind of are all contextualized by this happening to him um, and it is becomes symbolic of a lot of things, etc, etc. So anyway, it's an interesting premise for a book. Um, and again, the beginning of it when we're in the museum and all this is happening, I think it was like very evocative and beautifully written. The middle of the book was genuinely a slog to get through. And in a way that I've heard people say that about the secret history where they fi find it pretentious and hard to get through and slow and boring. I devoured the secret history. I it I took it slowly and it still wasn't long enough for me. I was just like savoring every word on every page. I loved The Secret History. And The Goldfinch, it just was not that for me. I didn't, I didn't like it. I finished it and it just felt like, eh, that was really long and not really worth my time. Um, it was like fine, but I think it won the Pulitzer Prize. It certainly won something. Maybe the man Booker, I should have looked this up, but I didn't. Anyway, so it was award winning and definitely got high praise. And again, it got adapted. So after reading the book, I watched the adaptation and the adaptation was panned from what I remembered. So I went into it being like, well, I already didn't like the book. So like, this is going to be really bad. And I liked the movie a lot better. <laughs> the movie changed, like it wasn't perfect. There's some things that the movie changed that like I did like better in the book. Um, but the thing the movie did that really helped the entire thing just flow better and work better um, was that instead of telling the story linearly, um, which the Goldfinch book is what completely just linear chronological storytelling, um, the Goldfinch movie does basically what the secret history does. And it kind of opens by telling you the ending, 
or at least telling you like um like being way farther ahead in the story and then kind of circling back and like catching us up to that point point. and this for the secret history and then in the movie of the goldfinch creates this like sense of like driving towards zero hour like you know kind of like everything um from the context of the future now like has significance in a way that it doesn't when you're just going through it chronologically um and i feel like if the secret history had been written the way the goldfinch is where if you don't know the secret history is about a group of classic students and one of them is murdered by the others and you know that in the beginning and then the rest of the story like is how did that happen and then the fallout of it after it happened but you know like everything going into it everything is like colored by this knowledge that is going to happen um so the goldfinch again i don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen the movie or read the book but the goldfinch you know has like um nothing like quite like the secret history but it has a fairly climactic um like point towards near the end and you don't know anything about that when you read the book because it's chronological the movie tells you up front so that when you're watching the movie and you're watching all the events that lead up to this, you know, you have the sense of it leading towards that, towards this moment, towards these um, uh, consequences. So there's like specifics in the book that are, are specifics in the movie that are changed from the book that like, uh, maybe the book's better. But I just think like literally just that structural change, if the book had been slightly like not completely rewritten, but you know, just kind of reorganized um, to give you that same like, I know where this is going from the beginning. Um, that would have like made the book like I think I gave it three stars it would certainly have bumped it up to a four stars possibly five stars I really enjoyed the film and I also think that um for all of like whatever I think Donna Tartt hates the movie as well I, maybe I made that up but I feel like she also did not like the movie but like I feel like it was well cast well shot I think Nicole Kidman plays his mother I think Ansel Aghorn whatever his name is I think he plays the the main the protagonist anyway I I really enjoyed the film and I was like yeah if the if the book had been structured like this it would have been just so much better. Um, and I don't really know what people's problem with the movie was, to be completely honest. Like, there's some little things, sure. But overall, I thought it was like a really good adaptation. So, I don't know. Maybe those same people love the way the book is structured and completely disagree with me. So in that case, yeah, if, if what you loved about the book was that it's told linearly, well then yeah, I guess the movie wouldn't work for you. Uh, the next two on the list are actually TV shows, but like I don't think it really, I mean the point is that it's being adapted for the screen. So next on the list is The Discovery of Witches by, the books are by Deborah Harkness, I want to say. Is that correct? I hope that's correct. What did I do first? I think I might have seen one episode or like seen trailers or something for the show. And then like that's what got me interested because I had seen the covers of the Discovery Witches books and they like never called me. I was not interested. Um, but I think I for some like I got somewhere the information that this was like taking place in Oxford, like an Oxford scholar. But then there's also like vampires and it's like mysterious and like possibly romantic. And I was like, oh, actually, that sounds like kind of interesting. That sounds kind of good. So I read the first book and then watched the show. So like either finished the show or watched it. Um, again, I'd seen probably a trailer, I want to say. It's been a while. Anyway, the book was terrible. Um, not, okay, I shouldn't say terrible. The first book was, like, mediocre. Again, the Oxford, um, setting was its strong suit. And then, like, I found kind of interesting the sort of lore about, like, how vampires work in the world of these books. But, like, overall, it was kind of, like, cliche and cringy and not the best thing ever. But the way this first book ended, which set up where the next book would be taking place and what would be happening in the next book, super got my interest. I was like, oh, that sounds like really good. So I was very excited to read the second book and then also keep watching the show. The second book was way worse. It was just everything that was bad about the first one was like turned up to 11 in the second one. Um, and then I also watched the, the TV show and the second season was like much like I thought the first season of the show was better than the first book, but it wasn't like that stark a difference. And then the second season of the show was like, the the, the graph was like, like going like this right where like they started pretty close to each other and then the books just got worse and worse and the tv show was like pretty decent and fixing a lot of things that were bad about the books so my estimation like there was a bigger and bigger gap and then the third one i just read it to kind of finish it because i was like well i've been like reading the book watching the show reading the book watching the show for each season let's do it with the third one i was like this is not going to be good it was even worse than i was prepared for it to be like i was thinking it was like it's just not going to get better it's but it was worse it was so much the third book was truly one of the worst books I've ever read in my life. It made my worst of the year that year. And the show, the reason the show is better, half the reason the show is better, is because the book is told from the perspective of like the like female main character. Um, and this is the same thing that's the problem with the next one on the list. So just like copy paste what I'm saying right now. And like you get like a lot of uh, her, a lot of her internal monologue, her thoughts and her, 
her thoughts are infuriating. <laughs> I find her so annoying and unsympathetic and 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 the romance is just so bad in Discovery of Witches. It is like I already struggle with the whole like I will die without you. You're the only thing that matters in the whole world to me. If I, you're not in my line of sight at all times, like I begin to die. It's like that vibe and I'll just like I'm not here for it. And it just gets to be that more and more and more and the book has to like because they're together like the first book is the will they or won't they and then second and third books is like you know they're together so everything is to, like external conflicts so like we have to keep coming up with reasons for them to like feel this like angsty anguish about being parted or like doubting each other it's just like so awful to read so i i do not recommend the books at all do not read them if you watch the show and you were like i kind of enjoyed the show maybe i should read the books don't the show is way better because you don't get her internal monologue and then also just the way that um, Teresa Palmer, I think, um, the actress who plays her, she just plays her like you wouldn't think that what's going on in her head is what's going on in the head of the character in the books. Like she, she has interprets the character a little bit better. And then like the, the like, I will die without trueness of it. Like both the way Matthew Good, the way he plays the vampire, again, there's like, it's like a cringy levels of desperation and angst, but the show does tone it down a bit. James Purifoy is in the second season. And I knew he would be, and my mom and I watched the show together, and every episode I was like, is he in this episode? Is he gonna be in this episode? I bet he plays this character. No, he doesn't play that character. Oh, who's he gonna play? I bet he can play this character. He's gonna be in the next episode. And like, finally we got to the episode where James Purifoy was in it. My mom was like, is it everything you hoped and dreamed? And I was like, it's better. <laughs> so the show is like, you know, good vibes, very like nice sets and locations. They kind of like, they built um, a Bodleian library set for the first season when they're in Oxford and like, or did they film inside the Bodleian library? They were either permitted inside in order to like get reference for it to build their own. I think they built their own because they do a lot of like, um, you know, there's like supernatural effects and things, stuff has to like fly around and explode or whatever. So they're not gonna let them do that in the Bodleian library. But like, it's a very convincing Bodleian library for someone who's never been. So it's, it's like, especially the first season when they are in Oxford, like it's just like, a vibey good time. There's like vampires in Oxford, you know, what's not to like. Um, so it's not great, but it's like miles in a way better than the books. The books are painful to read. Do not read them. Don't do it. <laughs> and in the same vein, Outlander. But who's the author of Outlander? I feel like the name is like always one that I struggle with pronouncing. Well, everyone knows what Outlander is. I read the first book long before it was ever a TV show. And I think I actually, I mean, I definitely finished it, but I feel like I DNF'd it at first and then I kind of went back to it and I was like, oh, let's finish it. It's it's the same thing as Discovery of Witches where like the internal monologue of the character is just insufferable. What's her name, Claire? Claire's internal monologue is just insufferable. And in the show, you know, we have multiple perspectives. We follow, like, it's not just the POV of Claire and the way the actress plays Claire. She, is, she still does things that are frustrating and I don't love. But she's not nearly as insufferable as she is in the book. The book is, I just was like, I have no sympathy for your situation because you're acting ridiculous. Like, this is so painful to read. Um, so, and again, the show, it's like, you know, beautiful shots of Scotland and the costumes are gorgeous and the music is great. So like the story has got some like cringy, angsty romance or whatever that's like, it's better than the book, but like mainly it's the vibes. It's Scotland and kilts and music and dresses and battle and whatever so like it's a vibey good time and the books aren't even that or at least I think I started the second one because I thought we would move on I don't think the show was out yet when I started the second one and I think I thought that the second one would then move on to like being about different characters and it was not it was very much still about Claire and Jamie and I was like oh no thank you <laughs> so <laughs> yeah do not recommend I mean they're super popular but I don't recommend. I guess similar to the discovery, which is if you watch the show and you were like, oh, I should try the books. No, the show is better. Uh, next one, I was probably gonna piss some people off, but Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. This was, aside from nonfiction by Agatha Christie, um, which I read in college, this was my first fiction by Agatha Christie that I ever read. And it was enough to like put me off the idea of reading any more Agatha Christie for a long time. I came back to reading Agatha Christie um, and I was glad I did because I've liked a lot of the other things I've read by her much, much better. But Murder on the Orient Express, the book, I despised it. Like I, I'm a, accustomed to classics, you know, being a bit dated and having, you know, saying things that are like a little like, oh, well, we wouldn't say that now, would we? That book like more than I was expecting had that. Just like the greatest detective on earth coming to, conc to conclusions like, well, Italians are all like angry, stabby people. So an Italian would stab someone. Like this is like, a genuine like way to analyze the murder from Poirot. 
I was like, what? I'm not even offended so much about like, you know, this caricature of Italians as I am. Like, that's just like bad detective work. Like, what? And like, I, I mean, I'd seen multiple adaptations of Orient Express before I read it. So like, I did know it was going to be happening, but this is not like, that's not the reason I disliked it because I've seen nearly every Agatha Christie adaptation that's ever been made. And I've gone back to read quite a few Agatha Christie's. And even for the ones that I know the ending, or at least I know how the adaptation ended it, sometimes it's different. I've often liked the book just fine, even though I know where it's going. So it wasn't that. But like David Suchet is the Poirot. I've seen all of the David Suchet Poirots multiple times. And the Orient Express, um, so to be clear, not Kenneth Branagh. Never Kenneth Branagh. I don't know that I would say I like the book better. I think I dislike them equally. Do not like the book and I do not like Kenneth Branagh's portrayal of Poirot. But David Suchet playing Poirot is always um, fantastic and his Orient Express is the Orient Express to me. There have been others and I like them all better than the Kenneth Branagh one. I like them all better than the book. But David Suchet. I mean, if you haven't seen him play Poirot, like he just is Poirot. Anyone else playing Poirot, I'm like, you're an imposter. He is Poirot. <laughs> um, not that I'm, you know, an Agatha Christie expert like Mara, but to me, that is Poirot. So yeah, the book um, was, was honestly quite painful to read. And like I said, it put me off Agatha Christie for a long, long time. And then I, I came back and I thought for a while that it was that I don't like Poirot. So I did, when I came back to Agatha Christie, I read things that were not Poirot books because I was like, maybe I just don't like when she writes Poirot. So I read some other stuff and I liked it better. And then I did read Death on the Nile, which is a Poirot story. And I liked that much better than Orient Express. Orient Express, like, he. Uh, next is one that like, also I thought of pretty much directly after I did the last video and was like, oh, how did I forget that? I actually have a video about this on my channel comparing it to already from years ago. And that is The Prestige by Christopher Priest. Is that right? Is that, oh, that sounds possibly right? Anyway, um, I mean, I read the book because I love the movie so very much. And the book, the best that I could say for it is that it is like this, this author came up with the concept. So like, I can't give Christopher Nolan credit for the concept, but Christopher Nolan took the concept that's in the book and improved upon it so very much, pretty much like from every perspective. The way the story is told to you is improved. The characterization is improved, the motivations of the characters are like honed and sharpened and made more compelling. The ending is a little bit different and I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen the book or if you haven't seen the movie or read the book. Um, I highly, highly recommend the movie. The book is like interesting to compare and contrast, but the movie, is, like, if you've seen the movie, honestly, like if you're curious, read the book, but the, the movie is way, way better. So like without spoiling it, the ending of the movie, it's similar to the book. Like it's not completely, utterly different. It is fairly different and it's different in a way that is not only uh, narratively just kind of more satisfying, but it's also because the, the movie kind of plays, I don't know if I want to say philosophical concepts, that seems like an overstatement of the case, but it does kind of like um, make you, I don't know, question things or feel uncomfortable about the implications of like what's being proposed as the what's going on. And the, the book takes it in much more of like a Ah, scary thriller ending. And the movie is more of like a lingering haunting horror when you realize what has been going on. And I just think that's like so much more effective. The book kind of gets like hammy and ridiculous at the end. It gets dark, but not in like a lasting way. It's just kind of like, ah, oh, that was kind of fucked up. Whereas the movie, it's like, it stays with you when you realize what the answer is. You're like, oh. And then like, it makes you think more and more about like the implications of what that means for what you just witnessed. And it's like, it's quite haunting. So the movie, like 10 out of 10. It's probably my favorite Christopher Nolan movie. I mean, I generally like Christopher Nolan movies. I can't think of any that I hate. <laughs> I mean, I, I like them all. I even like Tenet. But The Prestige is probably my favorite. And what's amazing about The Prestige, the movie, is that even though it's this kind of like mystery twist ending, it's a movie that like, it's rewatchable. Like the more you watch it, I feel like the more you appreciate it. It's one, it's not like an M. Night Shyamalan movie where you're like, well, I, once you know the twist, you can't watch it again because the fun was the, tw the twist. The Prestige, like the first time, it's really fun to, no to not know what's going on and to be surprised. But the watching it over again, knowing you know where it's going is honestly really rewarding because he's crafted it so masterfully that like, it's actually really fun to now go back and look at all the places that you missed it. The, the places where he was telling you the answer, where he was giving you the information. He wasn't like cheating and not telling you. At all times, the movie is telling you what's going on, but like in a way that you don't catch it if you don't know to look for it. And so it's, it's every time I watch it, I catch something new. It's really fun to watch over and over again. So 
if you haven't seen The Prestige, I highly recommend it. And if you're curious about the book, like I was, I mean, again, feel free, but you can take my word for it. It's not worth it. The movie is much better. Uh, next is one that I don't know that anyone will have seen it or read it, but that's The 39 Steps, which I, again, I read it because I had seen um, multiple adaptations of it. And because I had seen multiple adaptations of it, what I've generally found to be the case is if like there's multiple adaptations of something from like different times, different directors, different screenwriters, different whatever, um, but like certain things like remain true in each adaptation, you can be fairly certain that, oh, uh, well, that's probably in the book because every adaptation like has a few things different, but these things stay the same. So like that's probably in the book. So having seen um, two adaptations of 39 Steps, one from um, the 1930s or 40s, um, I think Hitchcock did it um, with Robert Donat, and then a much newer one done by the BBC, um, like in the 2000s. They were quite different from each other, very different from each other, but there were certain things about them that were the same. So I was like, I'm so I'm guessing the book's like that. The book is not really like either of the adaptations, and both adaptations, though they are very different from each other, are much better than the book. The book, this is again a little bit like Murder on the Orient Express, where it's like, I expect classics are going like prepared for classics to be like a little sus about its attitudes towards, you know, queerness, towards people of color, towards women, towards all these kinds of things. I'm just like, there's probably going to be some things that we wouldn't say today, you know, like your mileage may vary. It was like shockingly offensive. And then also, in addition to just like constantly saying things that I was like, wow, okay, the the answer to like what's going on, like to the, it's if you, if you don't know anything about the 39 Steps, the 39 Steps is like a, an espionage thriller type of deal, where in the beginning of the story, the main character like, like sees like a, someone get killed, and they are told something about the 39 Steps, but they don't really know what it means. And then they're like on the run, because like, it's a little bit like North by Northwest if you've seen that by Hitchcock. Um, and, and just like broadly, you know, protagonist encounters something, hears something mysterious, and now like people think they know something, people think they're onto something and they're on the run. Um, and so you follow them when they're on the run. And then part of the mystery is like, what is the 39 steps? And so there's the answer to what the 39 steps is, is different in the Robert Donat movie, the new movie, and the book. Like, they don't have the same answer. <laughs> None of them have the same answer. And the book answer is by far the worst one of all. Um, the both movies have much better answers for what the 39 Steps is. <laughs> the book was just, like, offensive and bad and narratively unsatisfying and just, a like, a bafflingly horrendous read. I was just kind of at, at, at a certain point I was reading it just kind of like to gawk at it. So I recommend both films. I, the old Hitchcock one I really enjoy and then the new one which is quite different from the Hitchcock one is also really um, fun to watch. Don't read the book. If you're like me and you watched either or both adaptations and you're like oh I bet the book the book is not good. Don't read the book. Don't do it. <laughs> And last but not least is The Shining by Stephen King. When I first started my Stephen King journey, I read Pet Cemetery, and I really liked Pet Cemetery, but I was like, this didn't like scare me the way I expected Stephen King. I expected it to be a scary read. And I was like, it's dark, it's haunting, it's tragic. Uh, it's not like a happy read, but like I wasn't scared. And I was like, so if I want to be scared by Stephen King, what should I read? And most people said The Shining. And so it was a few years that I was like, okay, I guess I'm ready to read The Shining. And I read The Shining and I thought it was quite goofy. <laughs> I was not scared. And the I, I, the beginning was the best part. Um, by the end, I was just like, again, this is neither atmospheric nor tense nor interesting. It just became cartoonish and silly to me. And was I was just kind of like, oh, violence, blood, oh no, scary ghouly monster things, oh no. <laughs> like, I was just like, this wasn't, I, it wasn't for me. But you know, everyone praises the film. And having read the book, then I was very curious to see the film. And the film I do like better than the book. It's I still don't like the film as much as I think a lot of people do, but I do think it improves on the book. I think the ending is better in the movie than it is in the book. Um, Jack Nicholson's performance is absolutely iconic. The location um, for the hotel, absolutely iconic. It's like visually a very compelling film. Spoilers for if I if and when I ever do the reverse video of like books that are better than the movie. Um, I actually feel the opposite about Dr. Sleep. Dr. Sleep is the sequel to The Shining, and I like the book Dr. Sleep much better than the book The Shining. It's probably sacrilegious to say that, but the movie Dr. Sleep I thought was horrendous. <laughs> so the movie of The Shining is way better than the book, 
And then the book, Dr. Sleep, is way better than the movie. The, the movie of Dr. Sleep is truly, truly atrocious. <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah, but we're here to talk about The Shining. The Shining, I do think, is better than the book. Um, there are, I think there are some things that I do like better in the book. I like how The Shining, the eponymous supernatural force of The Shining, is kind of described and depicted in the book a little bit better. I get why they depicted it the way that they did in the movie, especially for when the time that it was made. It's much less subtle um, in, the, in the movie. But again, overall, like as a complete package, I do think the movie is better. And certainly the ending is better in the movie. So yeah, those are some more movies that I thought were better than the books. I do like books, I promise. But in, in this case, you know, they stood to be improved. But let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about these, about others. If you'd like to uh, see a video about books that are better than the movie, because I promise I have some of those as well. <laughs> I don't always prefer the movie. But yeah, let me know your thoughts and I'll see you for my next bookish video.